Hey everyone, Chris here. Thanks for checking out the podcast. If you're enjoying it and learning something along with us, please consider becoming a supporting patron at patreon.com slash a teacher of history. Or you could leave a rating and review on iTunes. It would be a huge help. If you'd like to raise your hand and participate along with us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, at a teacher fist, or shoot me an email, chris at a teacher history.com. All right, let's get on to the next episode. Hello. Welcome in to A Teacher of History of the United States. Thanks so much for joining me again today. Did you know that General Andrew Jackson's expedition into Florida, which is often seen as an overreach of power and authority on Jackson's part, was probably to be expected? And President Monroe likely knew he was going to do just what he did. And when he did, Monroe was both excited and proud of Jackson for it that not everyone was on board with Jackson's actions in Florida. With men like Henry Clay publicly denouncing his actions as unconstitutional, forcing President Monroe to come to the defense of his general and legitimize said actions. And that this era of good feelings was, well, really good until it wasn't. The Panic of 1819 seemed to bring an abrupt end to this unprecedented unity and set the United States up for another version of the two-party system. Did you know all of this? Maybe, maybe not. Get your notebooks out, because today we will cover that and more in episode 112, Jackson's Expedition to Florida and the Panic of 1819. All right, everyone, welcome in to another episode Last week, we covered much of the first term of the Monroe presidency. We discussed the nationwide tour he embarked on, and we'll talk briefly about that uh, today, too. Um, And, of course, Monroe was taking a page of Washington's playbook when doing this, and the roaring reception he received in the process. Monroe was clearly a very likable and popular president that brought enthusiasm to the office and to the nation. It seemed like everyone loved Monroe, even some Federalists. Federalist Congressman John McLean from Ohio observed that his first visit to Monroe was great, primarily because of the, quote, plain simplicity of his manners and the easy dignity of his deportment. John Durfee of Rhode Island commented that Monroe was a, quote, plain man. He is the most modest and unassuming man that I have seen. His countenance is expressive of a good heart and an amiable disposition. But Monroe didn't just impress congressmen. His cabinet members shared the uh, similar aberration of the great president with John C. Calhoun, declaring that, quote, few men his equal in wisdom and devotion to the country. He had a wonderful intellectual patience and could, above all men that I ever knew, when called on to decide an important point, hold the subject immovably fixed under his attention until he had mastered it in all his relations. It was mainly to this admirable quality that he owed his highly accurate judgment. I have known many much more rapid in reaching a conclusion, but few with the certainty so unerring. As we discussed, post-war America saw the legislature embrace a far more nationalistic agenda. The Bank of the United States at this time was reestablished as the second Bank of the United States. The first protective tariff in U.S. history was passed, which we'll uh, briefly talk about the impacts of that today. The U.S. and Britain were able to settle up on the U.S.-Canadian border and Oregon Territory while also negotiating the annexation of Florida away from Spain. Meanwhile, the Marshall Court was reinforcing the concept of federal government supremacy and or the limitations of state power with cases like McCulloch v. Maryland and Dartmouth College v. Woodward. So everything was hunky-dory, right? 
Wow, did you say that out loud? Uh, okay. And for the record, I guess hunky dory means going fine. So for the most part, in the first term of Monroe's presidency, yeah, things were pretty good. Fine is actually probably an understatement. Um, but as I alluded to last episode, you know, the first two or three years of Monroe's presidency were really good, um, really, really great. Uh, the last five or six years were not that they were bad, but they were a bit more contentious. Um, and, and we'll see the seemingly perfectly united nation um, begin to fracture a bit and natural political divisions slowly starting to emerge once again. And we'll get into all of that. And I anticipate getting into a lot of that in this episode, but there's just so much good stuff about Jackson and Florida that we'll have to push that uh, political division for the most part um, into next episode. We'll, so we'll continue that narrative in episode 113. Um, so before we dive into all of that, I do want to talk about Jackson and Florida and the Spanish territory that we were able to annex and maybe provide some context for you regarding this. And this is really important, right? Because we know Andrew Jackson, um, well, if you don't know, now you know, uh, is going to become the seventh president of the United States and have an enormous impact on the makeup of the United States of America. And the, obviously the Battle of New Orleans made, uh, is what first had his, you know, name talked about constantly in the public, and then the expedition into Florida just sort of cemented him as as an American hero. So it's very important to talk about, and you know, Florida is a pretty important state to have. So, um, but before we get into all of that, I do want to provide you just a little bit of context on the Spanish territory of Florida and why Spain had it and. Uh, why they found themselves in their current predicament in the 18 teens when the U.S., uh, for all intents and purposes, just took it from them. So Spanish Florida was the first major European land claim and attempted settlement in the present-day United States of America. It's commonly believed that Juan Ponce de Leon was the first to discover it in 1512, which I mentioned all the way back in episode one, uh, although some contend that there were likely European raiders from the Caribbean who were capturing natives from Florida in the years preceding him. But we'll likely never know for sure, and it's really not worth nitpicking at this point. Spain saw their land claim shrink a bit over time, and in 1763, they traded it entirely to Britain as a result of the Anglo-Spanish War. Britain, following this conflict, had a lot of land to govern, you know, typical empire problems. So they decided that it would be easier to control Florida if they split it into two, West Florida and East Florida. It was split along the Apalachicola River, try saying that three times fast, uh, with East Florida being the peninsula and West Florida being pretty much like the panhandle. Um, I'll add a map of this division on uh, the Patreon page and the Facebook page uh, when I post this so you can check it out uh, if, if you'd like. For the 20 years that Britain controlled this territory, the boundary moved, the boundary of West Florida moved pretty far north, basically one third of the way into present day Alabama and Mississippi. Spain eventually regained possession of Florida 20 years later in 1783 and kept Florida separated in these two territories, although they shifted the border a little bit. Following the Revolutionary War, there immediately became a conflict between the U.S. and Spain over the Florida territories. Without getting into too many details, in this episode, suffice it to say that in the peace between Britain and the U.S., Britain specified the boundary of the uh, the boundary between the U.S. and Florida at 31 degrees latitude. Whereas in the accompanying treaty between Britain and Spain, there were no such specifications. Naturally, because of the ever-moving boundaries and what the Spanish viewed as successful expeditions in the southeast during the war, they were going to try and make a power play and claim as much land as they could possibly try to justify. With this, Spain and the U.S. were at loggerheads over the boundary of Florida, and honestly, they weren't even close to any type of agreement. Heck, Spain was claiming land all the way north to the Ohio and Tennessee rivers. Pinckney's Treaty in 1795 finally saw an agreement between the two nations at the 31st parallel, but this wasn't the end of the Florida question. See, Spain had way too much territory to govern, once again, you know, that's one of the problems you run into with empire building. And they really did not have the resources to protect their Florida claims. All they could really do was just protect the area immediately surrounding their towns and forts, and that was really about it. 
Tension rose steadily in West Florida between American settlers, the Seminole tribe, slave traders, and British agents. There were numerous insurrections against Spanish rule, and in 1817, a group of American and Scottish adventurers, coupled with some Latin American revolutionaries and pirates from Texas, laid claim to parts of West Florida and Amelia Island, which was all the way on the other side of Florida, on the Atlantic coast. To sum it up, the claims and governance of Florida, or lack thereof, created a bit of a mess. It was so bad that John Quincy Adams once told Spain that the U.S. forces would take control of it temporarily until Spain could get it together, with John Quincy uh, calling the territory, quote, a derelict open to the occupancy of every enemy, civilized or savage, of the United States, and serving no other earthly purpose than as a post of annoyance to them. This leads us to the Andrew Jackson expedition of 1817 and 1818. General Jackson was already well known in the South following his uh, victory at New Orleans and then his victory of over the creek, or I should say over the creek at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend and then his victory at New Orleans. There continued to be conflict during and after the War of 1812 with slaves escaping to the south and causing problems for the U.S. and various warring native tribes, making this region untenable for organized government. Andrew Jackson slowly pushed south, destroying a fort that was harboring escaped African slaves, killing hundreds of men, women, and children. So, in other words, when the War of 1812 ended, Andrew Jackson really didn't stop fighting. And after this, things did not calm down, and Monroe was beginning to realize that he was likely going to have to do something. American shipping had come under attack by pirates off the coast of Amelia Island, which once again was on the Atlantic border in Florida, and Galveston Island on the Gulf of Mexico. Galveston is just south of present-day Houston, and Amelia Island is actually just east of uh, present-day Jacksonville. And don't forget, so the, the U.S. believed it had some claims to the Texas territory following the Louisiana Purchase, so Monroe believed you could technically justify both of these attacks were harming American ship, shipping off of American coast. In addition to this, many of the escaped slaves and Seminole natives were crossing the border into Georgia, raiding and burning American farms, spilling American blood on American soil. Monroe told his Secretary of War, John C. Calhoun, that he wanted a military expedition to occupy Amelia Island and to pursue runaway slaves and these renegade Seminoles in Florida, unless they shelter themselves in a Spanish post. If they were to do that, then it was hands off. As Monroe explained, quote, an order by the government to attack a Spanish post would authorize war to which by the principles of our Constitution— The executive is incompetent. Congress alone possesses the power. General Edmund P. Gaines was chosen as the man to occupy Amelia Island, while the brazen General Andrew Jackson was tasked with leading the campaign in northern Florida. But Calhoun's instructions were crystal clear. He told Jackson to, quote, adopt the necessary measures to terminate a conflict which it has ever been the desire of the president from considerations of humanity to avoid, but which now made necessary by their settled hostilities. Monroe made things even more murky by adding to Calhoun's instructions, informing Jackson that the Seminoles had, quote, long violated our rights and insulted our national character. Great interests are at issue, and until our course is carried out triumphantly, you ought to withdraw You ought not to withdraw your active support from it. So, General Andrew Jackson found himself in a pretty difficult spot. He was told by Calhoun to, quote, adopt necessary measures to terminate the conflict, and then by President Monroe that he needed to continue fighting until the, quote, course was carried out triumphantly. Now, Andrew Jackson was pretty sure he knew what that meant, but he wasn't 100% comfortable with it. He had no interest in violating the Constitution and becoming a punching bag for these constitutionalists. But in his mind, there was no way that Calhoun and Monroe were not in any way implying he needed to likely attack Spanish troops in the process. 
which would create a de facto declaration of war against Spain, which Jackson does not have the constitutional authority to do. Jackson was shrewd enough to make sure that he wasn't the one blamed for what was about to happen if it went bad, but he figured he would have to see what happens next. And honestly, I believe that Monroe knew exactly what he was telling Jackson to do, and he knew that Jackson would do it. And any way to prove that? Well, no, of course not, which is why you are free to disagree with that opinion. But these two guys, and and this is the basis of my opinion, right? These two guys were great friends. Their friendship traced back uh, for, uh, you know, three years now, back to the Battle of New Orleans, and Monroe clearly took a liking to Jackson. They kept up private correspondence with Monroe once opining to Jackson that their relationship was, quote, one which I wish always to exist between us. It is very gratifying to me to receive your opinions on all subjects on which you will have the goodness to communicate them, because I have the utmost confidence in the soundness of your judgment and the purity of your intentions. Write me without reserve, as you have done, and the more so, the more gratifying your communications will be. Monroe even told Jackson privately that the reason he wrote him as often as he did was because he wanted Jackson very familiar with his view on things, and Monroe made no secret to Jackson that he had his eyes firmly set on Florida and even Cuba. And you may say, yeah, but how do we really know that Monroe knew Jackson would be as aggressive as he was? Well, during the War of 1812, when Monroe was Secretary of State and Andrew Jackson assaulted Spanish military facilities in Pensacola, Florida, which was unconstitutional, might I add, Secretary of State James Monroe didn't seem to bat an eye. So, knowing Monroe pretty well and seeing that he had turned a blind eye the first time Jackson attacked the Spanish unconstitutionally, Jackson replied to Monroe that, quote, let it be signified to me through any channel, say, Tennessee Congressman Mr. J. Ray, the possession of the Floridas would be desirable, and in 60 days, it will be accomplished. Monroe, though, did not reply to Jackson. He knew he couldn't, or else it would be unconstitutional. And he also didn't want there to be a paper trail in case things got heated with Spanish, or with his own Congress. But Monroe did instruct Calhoun to tell Jackson not to, quote, attack any post occupied by Spanish troops. But for whatever reason, that message, a really important one, was never delivered to Andrew Jackson. Who knows why? Did Calhoun refuse the delivery, hoping it would compel Jackson to act? Was it all just done for plausible deniability, meaning Monroe didn't actually, he wanted to send the message to Calhoun to show he sent it, but he didn't want the message forwarded? Or was it just an honest mistake? Well, whatever the reason, it did not get relayed to Jackson. All Jackson knew was that he told Monroe he would take Florida if he wanted him to, and no one ever told him not to. So that's what he decided he was going to do. Jackson took his 1,000-plus troops across the Georgia-Florida border and unleashed hell. He captured Spanish forts, burned down the entire village of Bowlegstown, and the 300 homes in it. He then turned west and was determined to go scorched earth across the panhandle. Every Seminole or black village or fort that Jackson came across was destroyed. In order to further terrify the population and put down any resistance before it even began, Jackson publicly hung two Creek chieftains. On May 24th, Jackson and his men marched into Pensacola, a Florida town controlled by the Spanish. By this point, Jackson had more or less taken control of the entire panhandle. While there, he encountered two British citizens, which he accused of aiding the enemy. He hung one and shot the other, publicly, in front of the Seminole natives, in order to ensure that he was sending the proper message. On June 2nd, Jackson wrote to Monroe, reporting his success, proclaiming that he had won the Seminole War, but he was ready to keep going. If Monroe would send more troops... He would, quote, ensure you Cuba in a few days. When Monroe found out about Jackson's, quote, victory in Florida, he was ecstatic. Monroe realized that Calhoun was a bit uncomfortable with how much leeway Jackson had given himself, but Monroe calmed him down, explaining just how good this was going to be for the United States. 
It was after the news of the victory of Florida that Monroe decided to bark on the southern leg of his nationwide tour, the same nationwide unifying tour I mentioned on last week's episode. As Monroe was traveling on his southern tour, though, he received word that Congress was not so elated about Jackson's shenanigans in Florida. Because when you think about it, it makes sense. Congress is the one with the authority to declare war. Jackson had more or less declared a war on the Spanish, taking Congress's power of war declaration away from them. And when congressmen get their power usurped from them, they're usually not too happy about it. Henry Clay publicly declared that Jackson had violated the orders given to him by Calhoun, and his actions in Florida were unconstitutional. With word of growing tension in the capital, Monroe bailed on his southern trip and headed back to D.C. to see what all the fuss was about and to defend Jackson's actions. And Monroe had good reason to, because, look, not only was Spain a paper tiger and Monroe knew they posed little real threat, but the American people were just as excited about Jackson's victory in Florida as he was, so he was going to get behind his general. Monroe declared that Jackson's actions were, quote, an act of patriotism essential to the honor and interest of your country. The United States stands justified in ordering their troops into Florida in pursuit of their enemy. They have the right by the law of nations. If the Seminoles were inhabitants of another country and had entered Florida to elude pursuit, it is not an act of hostility to Spain. It is less so because her government is bound by treaty to restrain the Indians there from committing hostilities against the United States. So basically what Monroe is saying here is that Jackson going into Florida wasn't a declaration of war against Spain. In fact, it's Spain's responsibility to keep them in line. If they flee to Spanish territory, then Spain needs to make sure they don't continue to commit acts of atrocity against the United States. With that said, though, Monroe recognized that it was likely the best move to withdraw the troops to the other side of the Florida border, because just leaving them there would surely be an unconstitutional act of war. So with all the leverage, Monroe told John Quincy Adams to instruct the American minister in Madrid to make an ultimatum. Either Spain needed to give up Florida, or Spain needed to prevent attacks on American territory that were coming from Florida across the border, which there was no way they were going to be able to do. And with that, Spain and the U.S. brokered the deal that I mentioned last week, the adams oni Treaty, or the Transcontinental Treaty. The U.S., got east and west Florida, Spain gave up any claims to the northwest, the U.S. US gave up any formal claim to Texas, even though they reiterate that they believed it was in fact theirs to claim, Um, and the U.S. agreed to pay off $5 million in debt on Spain's behalf. Monroe's gamble had seemed to pay off. Through his efforts over the last 17 years, the U.S. had secured the Louisiana Purchase, settled a war with Britain, removing them from present-day U.S., and now his administration was able to annex Florida. America, through the help of James Monroe in a bunch of different positions in government, was truly becoming an empire. And things were looking great for President Monroe. As I mentioned last week, it really was an era of good feelings. Not only was Monroe able to eliminate the national debt, which was $67 million, incurred from the War of 1812, He had reorganized the military, saw an explosion of settlement in the West with roads and canals further connecting the regions of the nation. Eli Whitney's cotton gin had revived Southern agriculture, and cotton became the number one crop in the United States, replacing tobacco. In 1818, the first 130-mile stretch of the Cumberland Road was completed. This connected Cumberland, Maryland, and Wheeling, Virginia, which is in present-day West Virginia. This completed George Washington's dream of building a road that connected the markets west of the Appalachian Mountains to waterways on the east side of the mountains that eventually led to the Atlantic Ocean. The interesting thing is that the Cumberland Road had been delayed for years because the Jefferson presidency did not think that the federal government had the right to build it. But John Marshall's more liberal interpretation of the Necessary and Proper Clause gave Monroe the justification that he needed. With the Cumberland Road completed, western farming exploded. Farmers sent thousands and thousands of pounds of grain, furs, pelts, and other products using the Cumberland Road to get their goods to the east. 
In addition to the Cumberland Road, the speed and value of using steamboats made large-scale trading even more appealing in the West. And lastly, and this is something we'll talk more about in a future episode, but the first 15 miles of the Erie Canal had been built, connecting Utica and Rome in Upper New York State. Now, there was still a lot of work to do, but it was obvious that this was an engineering marvel, and Monroe was beyond excited for the potential they had held, knowing it would eventually link the Great Lakes to the Hudson River. Monroe declared, quote, At no period of our political existence had we so much cause to felicitate ourselves at the prosperous and happy condition of our country. The abundant fruits of the earth have filled it with plenty. But as I mentioned last episode, as well as things were going for the U.S. and Monroe the first few years of his presidency, they begin to become a bit more difficult as we enter the end of his first term in office. In early 1819, an economic crisis hit the nation, known as the Panic of 1819. An economic bubble popped and hundreds of banks closed down. And this is how it all happened. Following the War of 1812, European markets were starved for American goods, so farmers and planters expanded their production, snatching up land in the West so they could do so. To make matters easier for them, during this rush to the West, new banks were popping up all over the place. These state banks, and even the Bank of the United States, began making loans to these farmers. The problem was that the bank notes exceeded the amount of capital, or hard coin reserves, that the banks had on hand. Therefore, many of these notes were not actually supported by specie, thus making them potentially worth very little, or even nothing. And you may be wondering, well, how bad could it have really gotten? Well, one bank in Rhode Island had only a capitalization of $45, yet they found themselves issuing banknotes equal to $800,000. So, men were speculating to find opportunities to buy land in the West for as little as $2 an acre, sight unseen. They would then borrow the money, buy the land or the, under the assumption they'd be able to pay it back off of the money that they made from selling the land. To make matters even worse, many real estate speculators were rushing in to buy up as much land as they could so they could sell it for a profit. But the problem was there were many times they were selling land that they didn't own or they were selling the same pieces of property more than one time. And it was just – it was a mess. In January of 1819, in addition to all of this, right, we can all see it all setting up for a disaster. Uh, But in January, the U.S. saw cotton prices in England drop which had a ripple effect on the U.S. credit network since cotton had become the number one export and a lot of the money Americans borrowed from their banks, well, they did it expecting a certain amount of income from selling their cotton. To make matters worse, the Bank of the United States stopped all loans, called in all debts, and refused to honor many of the loans made in the western state banks. And giving the benefit of the doubt to Monroe and the government, you can see why they did it. They thought that these speculators in the West and these state banks were enabling them and ruining the economy. So the Bank of the U.S. declared that if you were a Western bank, you could only loan out money that was actually supported by specie or hard coin. With the situation in England and the new standard issued by the Bank of the U.S., many banks closed down which forced a run on the banks that were still in business, people cashing in their notes for coin before they ran out, knowing that they likely uh, issued far more notes than they had. This stressed the banks out to the max and eventually caused them to collapse under the weight of their own bad loans. With this, as you can imagine, bankruptcy soared and farmers and businessmen in the West were crushed. Because people found themselves in debt that they could pay their way out of, they were forced to liquidate their homes and their farms. The Panic of 1819 was pivotal in American history, and here's why. President Monroe, watching the progress he had worked so hard to cultivate, began to collapse under the pressure of this economic crisis, the the progress he had made, not, not President Monroe himself. But President Monroe was upset about it. He was helpless to do anything about it. The Constitution had left control of the banks to states, and many of Monroe's fellow Republicans were not going to allow federal power to extend to another American industry, especially one as important as banking. Following this crisis, the Western and Southern farmers viewed the Bank of the United States 
some of them did, as a monster bank, an institution filled with Eastern elitist snobs who knowingly and intentionally destroyed the lives and businesses of many of these Western farmers. These feeling towards the bank would not subside, uh, uh, and in nine years, when Andrew Jackson is elected president, he is going to publicly oppose the Bank of the United States and use that issue to garner a lot of support in the South and the West. In addition to the avarice and corruption that many thought the National Bank represented, the Western farmers also blamed the tariff of 1816 for their troubles. In their minds, this unfairly raised their cost and was unconstitutional. Because in the minds of the Western farmer, this tariff clearly was a tax passed to make their lives more difficult while supporting northern manufacturing. It protected the manufacturing in the north while hurting them. How is that fair? Now, uh, to be fair, many economists would argue that the panic of 1819 wasn't really a panic. It was just sort of a brief economic downturn. And that people who were really hurt by it were the ones doing the swindling and the speculating, or the ones who got swindled. For the most part, it was tough for a little while, but the established successful farmers and businessmen ended up just fine. But this reality was not going to stop opponents of the increasing federal power to use it as a rallying political issue moving forward. With the tariff of 1816 and the actions of the National Bank clearly making life more difficult for some farmers in the West and the South, the era of good feelings was abruptly coming to an end. Many in the South, in response to this panic, will adapt, or more accurately for many, return to a doctrine of states' rights. In the minds of many, the North and the federal government were in cahoots, and they wanted to limit this explosive nationalist trend and focus on protecting the rights that they thought were being trampled on. Next episode, we'll continue to examine how this national unity kept crumbling and how American division continued to grow in the post-war period. We will look at the issue of Missouri, briefly cover Monroe's second term, which was far less action-packed than his first, and look at the election of 1824 an election that saw Andrew Jackson secure the most popular votes and the most electoral votes and still lose to John Quincy Adams. Yep, you heard that right. I guess there's a reason why the election of 1824 went down in history with the nickname The Corrupt Bargain. As you pack up your things, I'd like you to consider just how fragile this young nation continued to be and how fickle many Americans were with regards to politics and business. The lives of those living in the coastal regions of New England and those living in the deep south or settling in the west were drastically different. The ever-changing interpretation of the Constitution and the expansion of federal power was doing great things for many Americans, but for others, they felt like, and understandably so, they were victims to this changing landscape. They wanted someone who was going to speak to their needs and protect them from the growing consolidation of power and money in the north. And these feelings are going to create the division in the United States that is going to lead to another two-party system. Ah, that's the America we know and love, one with some political drama and competing economic interest. Thanks for listening, and hopefully now you can take pride in knowing just a little bit more about the history of the United States. Class dismissed. <laughs>